Welcome to Longevity by Design, a podcast designed to give individuals access to the leading scientific information in the field of longevity. The ability to add years to your life and life to your years needs no opinion. Join us as we ask science to take the wheel. In each episode, Dr. Gil Blander joins a co-host and an industry expert in the field of longevity, shining a light and getting the answers to the key question, how can we live a longer, healthier life? Hello, I'm Ashley Reber. Welcome to Longevity by Design, How to Live a Longer, Healthier Life. I'm joined today by Dr. Gil Blander. We're produced by Inside Tracker, your science-based guide to optimizing your body from the inside out. Our guest today is Dr. Jennifer Garrison. Dr. Garrison is a neuroscientist with a PhD in chemistry and chemical biology from the University of California, San Francisco. She's a faculty member at the Buck Institute, a research center that studies the mechanisms of aging. Garrison has her own lab at the Buck Institute where they specifically study how long distance signaling in the brain changes with age. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm super excited for this discussion. Uh, Jennifer, it's a great uh, pleasure to have you with us. And uh, just as a background, we uh, met at the ARDD meeting in Copenhagen a couple of months ago, and I was fascinated and excited to hear all the new discoveries and the knowledge about the uh, female reproduct- reproductive system and how little we know about it and uh, how complex it is and uh, how much we need to work more to make it better. Uh, but before we dive into that, I would like to hear a bit about your background. Why have you decided to become a scientist? And uh, why have you decided to study aging? Oh, wow. Sure. <laughs> well, I actually got into science uh, early on. My interest in science came from a desire to cure AIDS, actually. As a young person, I had uh, several people in my life who um, suffered from AIDS and died from AIDS. And so as a teenager, I was really excited about getting into science because I, I thought I should, you know, do something about this horrible disease that had affected some people that I love. And when I went to college, I ended up studying molecular biology at UC Berkeley and I actually had the opportunity to work in a lab that did some immunology. And I realized pretty quickly that I didn't enjoy immunology <laughs> In fact, I kind of hated it. It just wasn't, my brain just doesn't work that way. And so I started, I was really good at and really excited by organic chemistry. That was one of the classes that I loved. And um, so when I went to do my PhD, I went and got a PhD in chemistry and chemical biology, which was really trying to use small molecules and the power of chemistry to study biology. And uh, when I, I went and did my postdoc, I wanted to switch fields and to learn something new. And at the time, I thought that the brain was really like the biggest unexplored area of science, at least in biology. And so I moved to the Rockefeller University with Corey Bardman to study neural circuits and behavior. But I brought with me my love of chemistry. And through my PhD, through my postdoc, and now in my independent lab, I'm really fascinated by bioactive peptides. So these are a very large class of neuromodulators that can mediate all kinds of signaling all over the body. And when I went to open my own lab, I had been thinking a lot about how these bioactive peptides can influence homeostatic processes, things like energy, fluid homeostasis, body temperature regulation, reproductive function, circadian rhythms. And, you know, it just seemed to me that those are that's a, a big place where things go wrong during aging. And I think the kind of inner tissue communication that we study, I think that this is one of the key, will be one of the key intervention points when we finally do figure out how to tackle aging. I, I think that disruption and communication between the brain and the rest of the body is really going to become the focus for all of the interventions that we end up using. Of course, I'm biased, so... Take that all with a grain of salt. And when I started my lab, you know, the Buck Institute was the only independent research institute in the U.S. that that studies mechanisms of aging. So it was kind of a natural choice for me. Excellent. And that's a, a, a great uh, a switch to uh, discussing maybe the hypothalamus. 
I assume that some of those peptides are coming from there. And as you said, that's your uh, uh, focus. Can you explain a bit uh, uh, what is the hypothalamus and the uh, why it's so uh, uh, important and why are you so excited about it? Yeah, so the hypothalamus is a, a small structure at the base of the brain. So in humans, it's about the size of the grape. Um, and it's located really just at the, the very base of the brain. And it's where the key neurons that control all aspects of organismal homeostasis are located. And when I say homeostasis, what I mean is the ability of your body to balance these internal states. And it really is what makes all life possible. And, you know, of course, circuits in the brain, neural circuits in the brain are composed of many different groups of neurons that are in different places that are all connected and talking to each other. But one of the focal points and maybe the, the, the most important control center for a lot of these homeostatic systems is they're all located in the hypothalamus. And what's cool about these neurons is that they're controlling not just the, the physiology. So, you know, for example, energy homeostasis, they're also controlling the associated behaviors. So for energy homeostasis, that means feeding behavior and eating. For fluid homeostasis, that means drinking. For circadian rhythms, that means sleep. So they're really, really interesting. And I, I think about this area as like a master regulator for systemic aging. So, you know, all of those physiologic functions that I just described, those are hallmarks of the changes that we observe during aging, right? The decline in um, female reproduction, for example, is one of the earliest things to happen that we can observe during aging in many animals. And there's uh, really beautiful work that's been done by many labs to show that there's an age-related increase in inflammation that happens specifically in the hypothalamus. And so that kind of dysregulation that might occur from that inflammatory processes and things like that and these homeostatic systems might be one of the things that happens, you know, that leads to what we think about as systemic aging. And, and, and do, you know what, <laughs> uh, do, do you know what is the magnitude of uh, the peptide? How many peptides are hypothalamus uh, release? Ah, ah okay. So it. coming back to this idea of bioactive peptides. So neuropeptides are what we're talking about. And it's really a misnomer, neuropeptides, because they can be made and sensed by non-neuronal tissue. So they can be made and sensed by lots of different cell types. So it's a little bit of a misnomer, but in mammals, in humans, there are hundreds of neuropeptides and many of them are, we don't know what their functions are, but one thing that's clear is that they're conserved. So all the way down to worms, for example, and nematode worms, Worms and humans have similar numbers of neuropeptides and neuropeptide receptors. Now, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation. There's some very worm-specific peptides and some very human-specific peptides, but there is a lot of overlap. And, um, you know, that, uh, the fact that there still are hundreds of neuropeptides in mammals means that evolution has a really important role for them, right? We, we wouldn't have this huge diversity of peptides if, if there wasn't a good reason for them to be there. And they are... You know, when you think about neuropeptides, there's really three components to that kind of signaling that you have to think about. So one is the cell that's releasing the peptide. Now remember, these peptides are not, they're not active until they're released from the cell. So that's one component of the system. Another component of the system would be the cell that has the receptor. So the thing that allows that cell to sense the peptide. So the peptide will be released in one place, travel some distance, bind to a receptor on a target cell, and then activate signaling processes in that cell. So that's two components to the system. The third component is that there are enzymes that, to, that can degrade neuropeptides. Um, and those obviously are an important part, point of regulation. Um, so in addition to having hundreds of neuropeptides, they may signal through multiple different receptors, um, one receptor might sense multiple peptides. One peptide can signal through different receptors. So there's, it becomes very quickly a, a really, a really complicated uh, web to try to disentangle. And then using them to perhaps try and delay the aging process. What would that look like? Are there ways to leverage these neuropeptides or the hypothalamus itself? So one nice thing about neuropeptide signaling is that it's been a sub 
the topic of study for a long time. So classic endocrinology really focused on on hormones. And, you know, the word hormone just means a, a signaling molecule that can signal over long distances. So neuropeptides are hormones, but not all hormones are neuropeptides. But there's been a lot of work over many decades um, trying to understand the function of some of these peptides and their receptors. And um, there have also been, what one of the nice things about them is because they're peptides um, and because they're binding to these receptors that are called G-protein coupled receptors, it's a very druggable system, meaning that there are a lot of different ways to tweak the system. And so, you know, there hasn't been as much work done to understand how peptidergic signaling changes during aging. I mean, that's one of the reasons that we, we're working on this. We think it's an important area of inquiry. But I think there's a lot of promise there simply because there's, there's just a lot of, um, there's, there's a possibility at least of developing small molecule or peptide modulators of these receptors and of these signaling systems. So it's, it's a druggable system, which is nice. The downside, of course, is that, as I alluded to before, it's, it's very complex. And so, you know, trying to understand how the system is working and how one might intervene to, for example, change something to do with aging, that's a big goal. <laughs> not something that's going to happen tomorrow, but I think it's a, a worthwhile goal to pursue. And uh, Jennifer, you mentioned uh, naval peptides and hormones. Uh, so can you define the maybe, what is the difference, or if maybe it's the same, but what is the difference, please say, for me, it's hard to understand between uh, neuropeptides and hormones? Well, they're, they can be the same thing. So hormone is a very general term. Um, it's, it, doesn't, it really just means any kind of signaling molecule that can travel over long distances. So it, uh, a hormone can be a peptide, it can be a steroid, it can be a biogenic amine, it can be a small molecule. So a hormone is a very broad class of signaling molecules and neuropeptides can fall into that. Um, so neuropeptides can signal through different mechanisms. So they can signal locally, like just across the synapse, but then they can also signal to cells nearby. They can also signal between groups of cells and then they can signal between different organs. Um, so when they're signaling between different organs, uh, that's when they would be considered hormones. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, it it's makes sense that they are similar, but they are not exactly the same. That's it. That's yeah, yeah, sense. exactly. They're partially overlapping, I guess is what yeah. I would say. Hormone is a really yeah. vague term uh, at the end of the day. Yeah. No, and, and it's, it's good to know because uh, I, I don't think that a lot of people know what is uh, what are those uh, neural peptides. So it's good that we are discussing it right now. And uh, uh, Ashley asked you about, basically, uh, there are uh, peptides that might uh, delay aging. Uh, I want to ask the other direction. Are there mm -hmm. some peptides that actually accelerate aging? So there are, I guess, one thing to know about peptides is that since there are so many of them, there's a lot of redundancy built into these signaling systems. So I think oxytocin and vasopressin are really good examples of neuropeptides. They have a lot of features of, of neuropeptides that, that are shared across the whole family of signaling molecules. So oxytocin and vasopressin, most people will have heard of one or both of them. It turns out that they are very similar because they arose from a gene duplication event. And so they're both nine amino acids. And they're only different at two positions. So they're almost identical to each other, but they have really different biological functions. And they can bind to each other's receptors and substitute for one another in some contexts. So, and, and that's what I mean by redundancy. So, you know, if you happen to knock out oxytocin, for example, vasopressin can do some of the, some of the things that oxytocin would have done. I'm not in a perfect way, but in a, in a way that makes it so that the real phenotypes of, of knocking out oxytocin are masked by vasopressin coming in and doing the same job. So there's a lot of redundancy built into these signaling systems, and they're often not essential, which means that you can knock them out and the animal will still live. That's not always the case, but in general, they tend to be not essential. And that's actually really advantageous for a system that is quickly evolving right? 
And neuropeptides tend to mediate things like behaviors, things that happen on a longer time scale, at least with respect to the nervous system. So seconds to minutes to hours to days. And they also mediate things like behaviors. And so when you're trying to innovate at the level of something like a behavior, which, you know, for mammals is absolutely critical during evolution that you'd be able to change your behavior in response to changing environments and things like that. Feeding behavior, for example, that you'd be able to change how you go about looking for food or things like that, or just as an example. And so evolutionarily speaking, if you can make a mutation that changes where a receptor or a peptide is expressed and in that way evolve different behaviors or different things like that. That that's you can do that on a time scale that's much shorter than like evolving a new brain region or evolving, you know, a whole new set of neurons. So I think that's why there's so much redundancy built in. Having said that, neuropeptides are, you know, they're the most I, I think this is true. They're the most diverse and also the most abundant class of signaling molecules in the central nervous system. So they do all sorts of things. They are important for a whole range of different behaviors. Physiology I already talked about. They mediate the crosstalk between the immune system and the nervous system. And they are made and used by almost every tissue. And so Thinking about how they impact aging is a complicated question. And there are a few examples in the literature of neuropeptides that are known to impact aging. GnRH, or gonadotropin-releasing hormone, is one. And basically with age, GnRH levels go down. And the thinking is that that actually impacts several different attributes of systemic aging. Things like changes in muscle strength, bone loss, neurogenesis, memory. But that, that example is pretty unique in that we, we don't have very many individual examples of neuropeptides that impact aging in one direction or the other. And I think there's two reasons for that. One is that they're very difficult to study, you know, for all the reasons I just said, that the cool things that they make, they make them really exciting in terms of biology. The fact that they can signal over long distances and long time scales, those features of their biology you know, make it tricky to actually study them. And so I think we're just coming to the point in the last five to 10 years where we ha really have the tools and the experimental techniques to be able to ask really important mechanistic questions about how they function. The other reason I think that we don't know as much about peptidergic signaling as we do, for example, about like synaptic signaling, which I think everyone in the audience is probably picturing when I talk about neuropeptide signaling, so this, you know, small molecules that are released in response to an action potential that travel across a synapse, um, a synaptic cleft and, and pr propagate an action potential, that's not what neuropeptides are doing. And there's this nuance to, to neuropeptide signaling that's only really be been appreciated in the last few years as single cell sequencing technologies have really allowed us to ask in a particular neuron or a particular cell, what's the whole list of genes that are expressed just in that cell or that cell type? And what's, what's been discovered by several groups now is that if a neuron is making a neuropeptide, so for example, oxytocin neurons, which are in the hypothalamus, oxytocin neurons absolutely do make oxytocin, but they also make at least nine other neuropeptides. And that's true on average across the board. So if a neuron is peptidergic, it's going to be making probably a dozen different neuropeptides. And they might have synergistic functions. They might have antagonistic functions. They might be released together or separately. And I think that it may be the case, and this is just my idea, but I think it might be true that it might be the cocktail of peptides that a particular cell or tissue is making that's more important than any individual peptide. And so historically, I think most people have focused on, you know, they focus on one peptide at a time. They, they study oxytocin or vasopressin or GnRH, and they, you know, they, they focus on one peptide. But in, in reality, it's going to be the whole cocktail of peptides that those cells are making that, that really make up the, the kind of circuits that we want to understand and study. So Having tools that allow us to go in and interrogate 
not just one peptide at a time, but but interrogate, you know, all of the peptides that a particular cell type is making. I think that's what those are the kinds of things that will allow us to make a lot of progress in this in this field. I was going to ask you about. Inter- yeah, you should interrupt me. I feel like I'm just. No, it's very uh, helpful. I think I was going to throw in a, a question on how to, how do you measure these, especially if they're dependent on the environment or a certain situation? Yeah, it I mean, seems very difficult. <laughs> It is difficult. It's not impossible. And this is definitely something that has slowed down progress in the field. How do you measure them? Well, mRNA levels, looking at transcription, that doesn't correlate in any way, shape, or form to active levels of of peptide because they're stored in these vesicles before they're released, and they're only active when they're released. And so the active signaling that's happening with the peptide itself has little or no relation to the levels of mRNA that are being made in the cell. So the mRNA will tell you that a cell does make that neuropeptide, but it won't tell you anything about the active signaling that's happening. So really what you need to do is to measure them by mass spectrometry. So you need to measure the active released peptide. And that, you know, is a, I would say that's a, that's a burgeoning field. It's, it's really new. It's very distinct from proteomics which would be measuring protein levels by mass spectrometry. That's a a very mature field that's really well established. And and there's a lot of wonderful and amazing technology that's that's available to people who want to measure proteins by mass spectrometry. Measuring bioactive peptides that way, or peptidomics, is still an emerging space. And so we do a lot of that in my lab, and we had to kind of make a lot of things from scratch, databases and workflows and data analysis tools and pipelines. There there aren't really any off-the-shelf things that we can use to do those experiments. But that's that's really how you want to do it. You want to measure the levels of the active released peptide. That's tough work. (laughs) No, no, fun work. (laughs) Well, if we shift now from, you know, thinking about the organ systems almost. You know, Gil, as you mentioned at the beginning, was really interested in your work with female reproductive system and organ or ovaries in particular. So can you walk us through some of the interactions between the brain and the ovaries and perhaps what facilitates that communication? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. So just to say ovaries are, ovaries are, I think, not as complex as the brain, but certainly much more complex than most other organs in the body. If you think about what happens in ovaries over the course of a cycle, which could be anywhere from, you know, 21 to 34 days, um, the 28-day cycle is a total myth. But over the course of a, of a hormonal cycle in an adult female, ovaries go through this incredibly dynamic macroscopic remodeling um, like no other tissue does that on such a regular basis and in such a dramatic way. So, you know, ovaries have many different subcompartments, many different cell types, and they all go through this dynamic remodeling every single month. Um, and so they're, they're complicated, I guess, is, is the place to start. They're also unusual in that they age at about two and a half times the rate of the rest of the tissue in the body. So, when a woman is in her late 20s and early 30s, her ovaries are already showing over signs of aging. And that's very, very, very much falls off the curve in terms of the rest of, her, of the tissues in her body. So in a healthy woman, you know, when her, most of her tissues are functioning at peak performance, her ovaries are already aging in a pretty dramatic way. And so what we're trying to do is understand how and why ovaries age prematurely. And there's many reasons for that. Most importantly, obviously, I think most people in the audience will be familiar with the downstream consequences of ovarian aging with respect to fertility. But I think a lot of people are not aware of the other piece of ovarian function, which has nothing to do with fertility, but everything to do with overall health. So the ovaries make and secrete many different hormones. Some of them are steroids that you've probably heard of, like estrogen and progesterone. But they also make lots of other things that are important for general health. And when ovaries age, 
and stop functioning in the middle of a woman's life, that has dramatic impacts on almost every organ system in the body. So we, you know, in terms of the brain, there's the brain in terms of female functioning. There's the brain, there's the ovaries, and there's the uterus. Those are the main components of the reproductive system axis in a female. And for thinking about the brain, there's this constant dynamic chemical conversation that's going on between brain and ovaries. And it happens in both directions. And the cycle that we think about, which is really just in practice, what women experience is the building up of the uterine lining. And then if no pregnancy occurs, the shedding of the uterine lining, which is what we refer to as a period. But what's orchestrating that building up of the uterine lining and the shedding of the lining is a really dynamic signaling um, conversation between brain and ovaries, which includes estrogen, progesterone, LH, FSH. I'm sure that most people are familiar with or have at least heard of those. those, And some of those are proteins. Some of them are steroid hormones. GnRH, which is part of that loop, is a neuropeptide. His pectin, which is also part of that loop, is a neuropeptide. So there's a lot of different, it's kind of like an orchestra of a symphony of, of different chemicals that are going back and forth. And when and how those chemicals travel back and forth basically dictates everything about that, the physiology, the, the builds up of the lining and the, the shedding of the lining. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes Absolutely. sense. But, uh, but uh, a follow-up question about that. So you said that the ovary are uh, aged two and a half times faster from uh, all of the other organs that we have in the body. My question yes. is why? Why? If I knew yeah. the question, if I knew the answers to that, I would not be talking to you right now. Yeah. <laughs> Any hypothesis? We'd be working on something else. I mean, that's the big question. Why? Why and how? Why and how? So the why part is really, it really is a big mystery because humans are very unusual. We're one of only a, a few species that go through menopause. It's us and a couple of species of whale and maybe one species of non-human primate. So it's not a biological imperative. It's not something that most animals do. So why it happens in us is it's kind of a mystery. How it happens and what causes that really, really pre predictable decline in ovarian function starting in the middle of a woman's life, why that happens and how that happens, we don't know. If I could answer that question, then I definitely would, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have this research program. I would be doing something different. So, so, so my, my uh, question is, let's take other primates, like other monkeys that they live a bit longer. So they don't have menopause. They're basically an uh, old monkey can have a, a bare a child in a very late age. That's, that's cool. Well, so having a child requires more than functioning ovaries. Okay. So there's a lot that goes into actually producing a viable offspring that goes beyond having functioning ovaries. So uh, yes, but yes, they do, they do have you know, if they have menstruation, they menstruate all the way up to the end of their lives. And if, you know, if all of the other organs are intact and functioning properly, then yeah, they can have babies all the way up until the end of their lives. That's fascinating. Yeah, I did not know that. I mean, reproductive decline in terms of offspring generation is a feature of almost of all mammals and most animals, right? Definitely go through reproductive decline with with age, but in terms of ovarian function and menopause, menopause is really just a single day in a woman's life. Menopause is the day on which it's defined as the day on which a woman hasn't had a period for 12 months. And it's characterized, I think when people are thinking about menopause, they're often thinking about perimenopause, which is the period of time leading up to that one day. And perimenopause can last anywhere from four to 10 years. And it's associated with all kinds of really dramatic health, vasomotor symptoms, things like thought flashes and cognitive decline and brain fog and all, all kinds of things that are, are really difficult and tricky to navigate. And after menopause, you know, in terms of obviously fertility is, is one of the things that, that we all know about. So menopause means that you can no longer reproduce. But the, basically the end of ovarian function, it means that women have dramatically increased rates of heart disease, stroke, osteoporosis, cognitive decline, neurodegenerative disease, 
just there's just a, a really dramatic impact on women's health overall to losing their ovarian function. So that's really the reason why I got interested in this, because I think unlike male aging, right? So aging, if you think about aging as kind of like uh, across your organ systems, but, you know, there's kind of curve starts to really have a dramatic decline sometime in your 70s, 80s, 90s, assuming you don't have any other underlying disease. And, and of course, on this curve, female reproductive function does a nosedive right in the middle of a woman's life. Whereas males definitely go through a reproductive decline, but the reproductive decline in the male system is synced up with aging in the rest of the body. And so one of the goals of what we're doing is really just to do that, to try to sync up the ovarian aging with aging in the rest of the body. Because at this, you know, at this moment in time, we're at this really exciting place where longevity research has gotten a lot of traction. We're making a lot of progress. And as we improve healthy longevity, if we don't also improve reproductive span, if we don't also improve reproductive longevity in women, then then women will be living half or more of their lives after menopause in this Mm -hmm. compromised health state. And that, for me, is an issue of equality because men don't have to deal with this. They don't have their risk of heart disease quadruple over the course of five years because one of their organs stops working properly. So I think about this as an issue of equality. And I think it's, it's one of those things that I didn't really even think about until I started studying it. You know, I didn't, I didn't know that much about how my body works until I started um, getting into this research. So part of what I'm trying to do, you know, and one of the reasons I was so excited to talk to you both, is that I want everyone to understand why this is so important, why it's something that we all need to sit up and pay attention to, and why I think science funding and philanthropic funding really needs to to take a moment to think about, you know, this as a major, major issue as we as we move forward. Yeah, thank you for that. I certainly had never thought about it as a you know, we talked so much about expanding health span on the podcast, but I hadn't necessarily thought about the fifty year gap that could exist there for men and women kind of yeah, shifting my focus a lot. Is it possible to, there's a lot of famous 70 and 80 year old fathers, like brand new fathers. For women, if you wanted to focus on improving the lifespan of ovarian function, is it possible to decouple that from reproduction? Could you still get you know, all of the other benefits that you said the ovaries produce without necessarily expanding the amount of time that women could you know, become pregnant? So I think we don't know the answer to that question. I think we have some hints that, yes, they're, they're separable. So, for example, right now, the best treatment that we have for women who have gone through menopause to try to mitigate those dramatic health risks that I talked about is HRT, hormone replacement therapy. And certainly, we know that replacing a few of those hormones, a couple of the, the a few notes in that sensitive that chemical conversation between the brain and the ovaries, when we replace a few of those notes through hormone replacement therapy, so it's usually estrogen and progesterone and occasionally low-dose testosterone, that that can dramatically beneficially impact, you know, all of those things that I talked about. So it certainly is possible in that sense to decouple them. I think ideally what we're trying to do is to impact both arms, both sides of the equation. Now, I don't mean that we want to um, enable women to have babies when they're 70. Although if it were technically possible, I, I wouldn't, it's none of my business what someone wants to do with their bodies, but it requires a lot more than ovaries to have a, a child. And so, you know, we're not advocating for geriatric pregnancies. We're not advocating for, for women to carry babies late in their lives because there are a lot of health risks that are associated with that. But I think, you know, the, the number, there's a lot of things that, that go into ovarian decline, but really it's, it's, it's characterized by a change in the number of eggs, but also the quality of eggs over time. And so 
Women start with somewhere between six and seven million eggs when they're in utero. Then that number drops to about a million by the time a female human is born. That changes to about three hundred at the time a human female goes through puberty. And then once a, a female starts cycling, she'll lose about as eggs per month. And that continues steadily until until menopause when when she runs out of eggs. So by the time a woman's 40-ish, she'll only have about 1% or 2% of the starting number that, that she began with. And so what we would do is find a way to improve the quality of eggs that a woman has in the middle of her life and also just change that number by a small amount. If you could, you could increase that number by 1% or 2% at age 40, that would have a dramatic impact, not just on a woman's ability to choose when and how she has a healthy child, but it would also push out the edge of menopause a little bit. And changing that number by one year or two years or five years would be a game changer in terms of health benefits for half the population. So ideally, we would impact both. But at this point, we know so little about both all of this that that. I, I really don't know. So Jennifer, a couple of points. First of all, it's yeah. really fascinating. The, the first point is uh, related to the, as you said, the age of the uh, menopause. So I, I heard that uh, from you and uh, it was interesting for me. I never thought about it, that there is a correlation between the age of menopause and the longevity of uh, uh, this uh, woman, which makes a lot of sense. Basically, you, uh, you get into menopause later, you live longer. But the second point is uh, more a question about HRT. I think that there is a lot of confusion in the, uh, for normal people, let's say, not for scientists, about what are the positive and negative of HRT. Because uh, uh, at least in the past, I would say, uh, going back uh, I don't know, a few decades, HRT was considered to be a uh, pro-cancer. And c- can you a bit elaborate about that? I think that's a very important point for uh, women that are... Uh, going via menopause or thinking about menopause. I'm hearing it a lot. Yeah, absolutely. I did a whole webinar on this just because it is something where there's a lot of confusion. And this is true across many things to do with women's health. There's a lot of misinformation, a lot of confusion, not a lot of resources. With HRT, there was a specific study that came out in 2002 using data from the Women's Health Initiative, the WHI study in the U.S., which unfortunately it was a, as the initial results that were published were flawed at best, misinterpreted, and then terribly, terribly misrepresented in the media. To the point where a whole generation of women, I think, who were on HRT were suddenly taken off of HRT and doctors stopped prescribing it. And, and that did immeasurable damage, just it's incomprehensible, actually, how much damage that has done to a whole generation of women. So, like I said, I, I did a whole webinar on this where I, I brought in a, an OBGYN, so a physician who takes care of women at this stage of their lives. And we actually just took the study and we went through it point by point. And I talked about, you know, how we evaluate data, how do, you know, what does this data say? How do we use statistics? There were a lot of things about that study that were flawed. And subsequent studies, that was one, one paper that was published, you know, 20 years ago. Um, since then, there have been dozens of papers that have gone on to use the same data, which has continued to be collected to show that, you know, all of those messages that were amplified by the press were absolutely wrong, like a hundred percent wrong. So HRT is, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And maybe I'll talk about that in a second. HRT is protective in terms of heart function. It's protective in terms of bone density and protection from osteoporosis. Um, it's protective against all of those other things that, that I talked about. Um, and so it's probably the best thing that a woman going through menopause can consider. Now, it's not for everyone. It definitely, you know, it's a, it's a sort of thing where you really need to have a conversation with your physician. And, you know, there's a lot of 
it's a risk reward benefit. And at the level of an individual, each woman is going to have a different risk profile. So for example, women who have a history of breast cancer in their families might, might not use HRT in the same way that, that someone who didn't have that familial history would. So it's a place where personalized medicine is actually really important. But having said that, it's gotten a really bad rap, I think, because, well, for two reasons that I can think of. One is that it's, it's administered, at least in the U.S., it's administered kind of like a sledgehammer. So it's like a one-size-fits-all solution for a problem that is very much individual. And so it's a, it's a place, again, where I think individualized medicine will have a huge impact. And there's a lot of room for optimization. So in terms of low-hanging fruit in the space that where entrepreneurs can have an impact, I think looking at both the components of HRT, maybe adding in some other components, some other notes from that symphony is a really tractable thing that we can do. But also looking at the relative contributions, the relative amounts of each one of those components of HRT, and then also the, the total amounts of each for every woman is going to be different. And so optimizing the treatment protocol is the place where there's a lot of room for improvement. Having said that, I certainly will take HRT with us when I go through menopause. And, and uh, Jennifer, that might be a, a good segue to talk a bit uh, about the inequality of the uh, research of, uh, let's say, on the uh, males versus uh, women, or let's say male mice versus uh, female mice. Can you discuss that and uh, maybe discuss what you are doing in your organization to maybe switch it a bit and make it a bit more equal? <laughs> yes. Thank you. I would love to talk about that. So yeah, a few years ago in 2020, with a very generous donation from the Be Echo Foundation, I co-founded with them the Global Consortium for Reproductive Longevity and Equality, which is a mouthful. But that is the, we call it the GCRLE. And our goal is to facilitate and accelerate translating these basic science discoveries around women's health into products and therapeutics that women can use faster. Like that's really, that's really our whole goal. And the way that we have tackled this problem is three things. The first is grant funding. So when we came into the space, there's just a dramatic lack of funding for women's health in general, but especially for reproductive aging. There's just almost no funding at all. And so we give away grants to scientists all over the world. We had our first grants. We gave them away in 2020. The 23 scientists, $7.4 million. We skipped a year last year because of COVID, but um, actually today, just coincidentally, today we opened up the call for the second round of grants. So we're going to give away another $7 million in grants. And I hope to do this every single year going forward. And that relies entirely on philanthropic fundraising. So that's one piece of it is just literally building the field because it's not that this isn't an interesting area of science. It's just that if there's no grant funding, if there's no money, I personally can't work on a problem in my lab unless I have funding to do it. So funding the science is task number one because there's an incredible lack of data. So that's the second problem. I think over the last hundred years, the male body has been biology's baseline and that's been true in biomedical research. It's also been true in clinical research. So it wasn't until 1981, I think, or 82, that it was mandated that females be included in clinical trials in the U.S. for drugs. And still, women are, are really often excluded from clinical trials. And this has led to a whole host of really negative downstream consequences. So in the U.S., at least, 80% of the drugs that have been pulled from the market because of safety concerns were pulled because of adverse effects in women. And that's because if you test a drug on, you know, 180 pounds white male, <laughs> when you administer that same dose to 120 pounds Asian female, there may be very different effects. So including women in clinical trials has, you know, it's been slowly increasing and it's, it's getting better, but that's been an area of, of real concern. Uh, on the biomedical research side, males, male animals were mandated to be included in research studies by the NIH 
in 2016. So it wasn't until 2016 that the NIH said, hey, if you're getting grant money from us, you need to test what you need to do everything in both males and females. And the reason that, you know, that people have excluded females from their studies is because the inherent biology that we're talking about, the ovulatory cycles, the hormonal cycles, those things introduce noise into the system. Um, and so, you know, as a graduate student, even I was told to exclude, you know, to only use males because females would mess up the data. <laughs> but it turns out that noise, it's not noise, that variability is is important. And so it's really, it's really key that we that would be focused on females. I think this over-reliance on male models has blinded us to specific vulnerabilities that affect females. There's so much more that I would like to ask. <laughs> but I'm just talking about this time, for a long time. Like we got through maybe half of our questions just because they all led to other questions that just a little tangent, but maybe we could have you back for another podcast to dig into. A oh, I would love that. Deeper. Yeah. Thank you. Gail, before we shimmy towards the end, do you have any other questions that you'd like to ask? Yeah, no, I, I 100% agree with uh, Ashley. It's uh, really fascinating and it's an uh, undeserved audience that they need to know more. And as you said, uh, there is not even a lot of knowledge for uh, 51% or so of the population of the human kind, but they are basically relying on data on the immense, which is really sad. And you are uh, maybe a light being in this uh, darkness. So definitely would love to uh, invite you back uh, if possible. Uh, yeah, and uh, unfortunately, we ran out of time with uh, half of the question, not the uh, answer. <laughs> but uh, let, let's plan to do another episode about that. Oh, I would love to. Yeah, I would love to. Thank you so much. Well, one of our wrap-up questions that we ask all of our guests is if there's anything that you intentionally do with your longevity in mind that you could share as a tip with our listeners. That I intentionally do with my longevity in mind. Well, um, I do probably a lot of the things that your listeners do, I think for ovarian function, but also for longevity in general, lifestyle and diet are the best and the biggest change makers. Everyone wants a magic pill or a magic bullet, but the truth is like the kinds of changes, like those, that, those two things are the magic bullets <laughs> for, for most people you know, paying attention to what you put into your body and how you treat your body are, are the most important things. So I pay attention to my sleep. I wear an aura ring, not because I think auras, you know, the, the tracker that you should use, but tracking, you know, my activity and my sleep make me pay attention to them. And I don't eat a lot of meat. I know what I'm allergic to in terms of food sensitivities and I avoid those things. I get a lot of exercise, not necessarily always, you know, killing myself cardio. Um, I mix it up. I walk a lot. I do yoga. I do a lot of weightlifting and weight bearing exercises because as a female, I'm really sensitive to the fact that I'm going to lose a lot of muscle. So my estrogen levels drop, you know, keeping my bones healthy it really relies on having adequate amounts of muscle. So. I wish I had something more dramatic to say, but th those are the things that I do with my longevity in mind. Yeah. And, but by the way, that's the reality. It's, there is no silver bullet yet. And we need to work out. There is no way silver bullet. I completely agree with you. So uh, that's the only way as of today. Uh, so thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. That was really fascinating. Fascinating. Sorry. And uh, we'd love to have you back soon and we can discuss it later. And uh, we look forward to explore the research in the field of longevity each month with you and leading scientists. For more information, please go to insertracker.com slash podcast. Again, thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you so much, Ashley. And uh, I really appreciate that you joined me back. I missed you. And, uh, <laughs> see you all of you soon. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Longevity by Design. Please subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. Longevity by Design is powered by Inside Tracker, a personalized health optimization platform that helps people improve their lives by improving their bodies from the inside out using personalized, 
science-backed recommendations for nutrition, supplements, and lifestyle changes. To learn more, visit InsideTracker.com slash podcast.